Excellent. Uh, very well then. Hello and welcome. It's an absolute, uh, absolutely great pleasure for me to be back in Edinburgh, where I haven't been physically in, uh, well, at this point, about three years. But no, well, not even that, two years and a half, let's say. Um, but at least, you know, virtually I'm still there. And that's exciting. Uh, another thing that is very exciting is seeing the history and game society prosper and um, knowing a bit more about the lab because I remember uh, how this whole situation and the whole thing was starting. Basically, it was still pretty young when I was there some years ago. And it's very good to see that. You're still around. Uh, I do remember in particular uh, a conference that was organized uh, uh, when I was doing my PhD there. And um, uh, we had the occasion to talk with several people from uh, the board of the video games. And it was particularly exciting. Um, well, I feel like it's kind of intimidating to talk so much about myself uh, in uh, such a context. Um, I'm also not really used to ramble on about myself that much, so do forgive my ramblings if I go off on weird tangents. But apart from that, yeah, I'm extremely happy to share my experience uh, to uh, help others who are interested in the field, in the experience in general, and uh, who will be either interested in following the same path or a similar path, or more generally, I'm also really interested in raising awareness of a new growing dialogue between uh, academia and historians on one side, and uh, basically the world of video games on the other, which is something that I'm personally very involved in and extremely interested and extremely enthusiastic about. So if you are someone who is equally enthusiastic about this, you might actually see me around every now and then because I'm trying to cover all possible conferences uh, on the topic. All of this said, uh, why am I here? Let's go with a very short version of my story before I can go into more details and following up the, the important parts. Well, as said during the um, introduction, my presentation, I have studied classics at the University of Torino in Italy. Uh, from there, I moved over to the University of Edinburgh, where I got my PhD some years ago. And well, as you can see, I've been a gamer since, uh, well, not 20, uh, 2009, but probably much earlier than that, no, without probably actually, definitely from much earlier than that. But well, it just gave the idea that I've been doing that for quite a long time and it certainly didn't change while I was studying at university or getting a PhD. So on the basis of this interest, I applied for a job at Paradox and uh, surprise uh, myself or myself most, uh, I actually got the job. So I took a plane and it was the middle of the first wave of COVID. So I basically left with just one single piece of luggage. And that's all I had for about three months before all my stuff could move. And uh, well, I flew to Sweden. And that's exactly where I am right now, about two years and a half later, working at Paradox Interactive. Well, that sounds incredibly random. Right? So that's probably the main reason why you got interested in this sort of weird uh, evolution and development on my side. So possibly you will like and need to hear my story, the much less short version. Well, my story starts many, many years ago when I was a kid and I've always been interested in history. You know, like most kids, I've had an Egyptians phase, a King, Har a King Arthur phase, a pirates phase, you know, all the classical stuff until I actually found my great love in the Greek and Roman antiquities during high school. 
in parallel, I was also a gamer. As I mentioned, I've been such for most of my life. I started playing on the PlayStation 1 on, in what feels like ages ago, but it was probably the late 90s. And I mean, among my various interests, uh, I've played... Uh, Oh, let's see. Oh no, this remained behind. Well, anyway, stuff like Civilization II, Age of Empires, Europa Universalis, Medieval Total War. Uh, so a lot of historical stuff, as you can imagine, historical games, uh, for which I particularly like the thrill of reliving and rewriting history, which I think it's something that most people uh, in this room uh, will understand and share. And it's also something that it's one of the main and common things that most of our players have, um, a more or less superficial or more or less deep, in some cases, uh, interest in um, historical immersion and uh, the freedom and the power that you get from being able to rewrite to live and rewrite history. At the same time, I was also a big reader. And uh, what I found in games was that, especially certain games that were particularly focused on narration, on stories, uh, on characters, uh, well, what I found was that they sort of felt like uh, stories, the same stories that I would read about in books, but not something that you could just read from the outside, but something that at this point you could live yourself and see from the inside, you know, by being the, the hero of the story, the true protagonist. And therefore I loved mostly RPGs. So, you know, the kind of games where you have a strong story and a strong character component, and stuff that you can see here, uh, Final Fantasy VIII, Neverwinter Nights, Divine Divinity, uh, all names that, I mean, if you are pretty interested in games, you might recognize like, woo, ancient, but well, that was my childhood again. So I went through all my high school and stuff back then, and I finished high school and at that point, what was I supposed to do with myself? I faintly considered studying informatics at some point, but you know, that's something that you need. Uh, physics, ah, uh, the horror. I've never been one much for mathematics. I've never understood a thing of what I was doing while studying physics. And I really didn't want to be studying, you know, how you actually make a computer. I just wanted to study how to make games. But back in the days, or at least in Italy, there weren't um, game designing courses or anything in the, in the similar field. So I just went on doing what I loved the most. Apart from that, I decided to study classics. Uh, at Torino, my, my city, I took an undergraduate and then I continued with a master. And I was really passionate about it. But at that point in time, uh, well, it still is actually, so it's not much of a point to say back then. But generally speaking, the Italian market, um, the job market is an absolute mess. And uh, with a master degree in classics, you couldn't really do much unless you wanted to go into teaching. So everyone told me, go into academia, keep studying, you're really good at it, do research, you're going to love it. And so I did and came to Edinburgh. I took my time, uh, did my PhD, and... All in all, it took longer than it should have, should have. Things changed during these years. Academia was not what I expected or dreamed of. It was, uh, from my point of view, an extremely competitive and harsh place. And uh, the, it didn't offer any sort of 
you know, job security that I found myself wanting because at that point, you know, I wasn't getting any younger. I was in my early 30s and sort of not being that sold anymore on uh, keep moving around from city to city uh, with the pressure of producing a lot of articles all the time with the continuous uncertainty of not knowing where you're going to be for the next contract uh, that's going to be in uh, six months or a year more often than not so at that point I was completely lost I asked myself so now what how do you leave such a, a long track, a one-way track, as it has been for the past 10 years for me, uh, inside of which I hadn't had any other experience uh, in the job market, basically outside of academia or anything concerning classics? And what's going to, what could what was there, basically? I found myself really not knowing anymore how the normal world function uh, outside of academia. How does it even does it even exist anymore? So I started looking around and searching and, well, not really knowing what to do with myself from any points of view. Um, Edinburgh was very... The University of Edinburgh was very active in offering support and job fairs, for example. I've been to, I don't even know how many, but definitely several. And um, I tried applying to certain jobs that were uh, sponsored during these job fairs, but nothing ever felt right. Uh, I know that there are many people who come out from um, a, a PhD in classics and move on to work in banking, for example. And I personally know several people I studied with that did that, but it never felt right for me. It was always something that didn't fit me, if you want to say. And I wasn't a good fit for it either. So, well, I am going to be very poetic at this point, but... What was I supposed to do? The answer has always been inside of me all the time, as they say. So I asked myself, uh, what am I still very passionate about? Well, throughout most of my PhD, what did I do? I was playing video games, as usual. Yeah, mostly going mad at games crashing on me because that happens too, but mostly, you know, having fun with them, playing regularly. Uh, in particular, Crusader Kings 2 had been uh, uh, a great companion to me throughout my PhD. And then also, I come from classics, so I am sort of an historian and... Well, I've always been passionate about historical video games, so it felt sort of natural to, to start looking at Paradox. And, of course, it was the, the company that better matched my, my personal interests, but, of course, it also felt kind of approachable as they, the way they propose and recruit for themselves, but also geographically pretty close. I mean, I was in Edinburgh back then, and uh, the, the company is situated in Stockholm, which is, well, not that far at all. Another thing that I've realized, uh, especially in the last year of my PhD, was my growing interest in the uh, depiction of history and historical events and, and, and environments and characters uh, in games. Um, so it is something that I sort of followed up, started in getting myself involved into and interested into and being more curious about it. And I was glad to discover that it was a field that was sort of emerging, but it was still not that great. Uh, and uh, wasn't that great uh, at, well, uh, advertising itself, yes, yet. 
So all of this long presentation, just to say what kind of person I am and where I come from, and just to move over to what do you do at some point? Um, so which is the real meat of the seminar, I assume, what you are most interested in, so how I did it, what, what I did. Well, the first thing that probably you need to be reminded of is that uh, it's not impossible, but you do have a, a sort of disadvantage compared to some people who have followed more straightforward tracks. That said, it's really important to consider that it's not impossible. And um, it's actually getting easier and easier every year that passes. Um, one thing, one big advantage that you have, and you must have at least for, for these translation, and uh, that I had was being passionate about things. I, um, as I was saying, I came from a disadvantage, as in I didn't have a coding background uh, when I applied. It's not like I had ever worked in the video game industry. Um, I had never been even a modder, which is something that I don't know how familiar people usually are with, but well, basically modding means uh, modifying. So it is something that it is possible to do when many fans do. Uh, they create mods, so modifications of the, the code and the script of a game in order to create uh, uh, something new, so add new items, new events, new stories, basically, to games. I'd never done that either, but I was very passionate about gaming, about games, I was very passionate about history and in particular the games uh, that uh, were, were developed by Paradox. I had played them a lot. And uh, as I was mentioning before, I had a lot of interest from um, in the historical representation in video games. And uh, I wanted to try basically something new. I was ready to, to do something more, to learn. And uh, this is something that you, you should take into consideration at all times. Um, following a, a path that is maybe uh, in which you might be at a disadvantage, uh, a disadvantage at because of various reasons, but you are really passionate about will make you look a better candidate in any case compared to other people who come from a more traditional background uh, but are not passionate about it. Um, this is also uh, complementary to the fact that uh, you would also offer a different point of view something um, different from what the person who actually comes from the traditional background in that field would have. Um, another word of advice that I can give is that uh, uh, the university offers uh, a career service um, who are terrible at telling you what to do because they can't, there are so many things that you could do, but they're absolutely great at telling you how to do what you want to do. So um, I made the mistake of wasting time talking to them, trying to explore uh, possibilities or what I could do and didn't get much out of it. But once I actually decided okay, I am applying for this job as a content designer on Imperator Rome, because that's the game I started with uh, at Paradox. And um, I started preparing my CV and my cover letter. Uh, they were extremely helpful. And well, I can say it probably made a difference in uh, how well my application was received. Um, another thing 
uh, that I wish someone had told me before, or at least that I had believed uh, when someone told me about it before, is to don't take for granted your skills because academia is a self-references bubble in which all people are coming from a similar background, are required to do the same thing and develop the same skills, someone to a higher degree, someone to a lesser degree, but it, in any case, you are flexible uh, and uh, you have skills that are incredibly required and that I'm sort of spoiling here but <laughs> with this new uh, slide but I will come back to in more detail in a moment. So they are highly valuable and so that's another thing that the career service for example can help a lot and help me a lot in seeing what kind of skills I had developed uh, during my academic years uh, and uh, how's the better way to promote them, to let people know that I have them and they are cool and I'm a valuable addition. Uh, another thing to, to consider is that, again, you have been learning a lot, you are flexible, you are changing role completely. So you are the kind of person who likes to try different stuff, likes the challenges, likes the changes. You have that sort of flexibility to move over. And this is something that it's extremely appreciated. And also another thing that really surprised me um, and that was extremely, um, how can I say, appreciative of uh, when I discovered that it wasn't so weird or unheard of, is that actually, at least in some countries and in some contexts, uh, a title, as in an academic title, having a master or a PhD even more, is not just a title. Uh, like it is in Italy, for example, sadly enough. Uh, but many companies do appreciate that. And uh, especially because, for instance, in the, in the video game industry, um, there are not that many people who have degrees uh, and uh, most people don't have uh, advanced degrees. So, you know, master titles or PhD titles. So actually having those, uh, and being interested in coming there and taking all that value um, that you have accumulated through your academic years is still sought after and uh, it really weights a lot. So um, I promised you to talk a bit about skills as I had anticipated. So those are among the most important skills uh, that you should probably keep in mind uh, and the sponsor, because those were the things that I, I've noticed that I had when I finished the PhD and that I had taken for granted a lot. The first thing is that you are learners. You have been learners from many years at university and you have proved that you can learn even very specialized things and uh, one thing that we we used to tell us and um, we tell all the newcomers in our job is that everyone can learn code even if you have no background in the area but not everyone can be taught to write for example. So having an academic background means that, as I've pointed out quite largely, uh, you can write. And this is a skill that we take for granted a lot. But people who have never had to write um, a paper for a conference or um, a dissertation or even just regular essays let alone a PhD thesis, which is a mastodontic enterprise. Um, it means that you can write in uh, proper 
English, you can be, uh, you know, your own spell checker. You can uh, handle complex texts uh, and uh, are able to explain things in a clear way. And um, in my job specifically, that again, I will describe a bit more in details in a moment, but do consider that there is a lot of writing that it's uh, facing the player directly. So it's the kind of stuff that the player will notice if there are mistakes or if the, the text is not clear or it's not helpful or it's not engaging. So having someone who has the kind of experience is extremely valuable. Um, the next point is explaining. So it's something that I was already mentioning before, but the fact that you have experience in uh, maybe presenting papers uh, at seminars or teaching in front of a class. And that's again, a great skill because more often than not, uh, you are not just required to learn stuff, but pretty soon you are asked yourself to onboard new people. And, uh, or even just simply to explain to your peers what you have been working on and how it works, because they will be required to use the same stuff that you make. Um, because again, the gaming industry is not as, an isolated, it's not a bubble, as we were saying before about academia. It's actually um, a space in which you are working in a team and the team that can change very fast because the, uh, well, the rotation of position, but also the, uh, well, the amount of time that a person actually spend inside of a company and in a certain role might be very uh, low. So being able to transfer this knowledge is also something extremely valuable. Then again, you know how to organize yourself. You know how to organize large amounts of knowledge. You know how to organize your time. You know how to handle a long-term project. You know how to organize yourself around deadlines. This kind of things can't be talked. They, they are skills that you develop through experience, to, to time, to trial and errors. So, it is good that you have gone through these already. You have developed these skills. And finally, we're talking about uh, problem solving and initiative. Uh, the fact that a lot of work in academia, especially in the classics, in history, in this more uh, um, traditional fields, if you want to call them like that, uh, is the fact that most of the time you are working on your own. You are responsible for, for your essays, for your exams. You are responsible for your thesis, if you have one, etc. cetera. Um, you don't work uh, in a team in which you have to depend on other people basically doing uh, their part at the very least as people who for example come from um, engineering or biology or this kind of things you know people who work in a laboratory are more used to do uh, you on the other hand are used to working alone and the, making the decision making the calls and solving your problems and so on so once I actually learned about my skills and what was valuable about them, I was able to write a more effective CV and a cover letter that were specifically targeted to the, um, the skills and the requirements that the job position had which is something that, you know, at first sight, I would say, yeah, I don't know how to, to prove that I have any of these skills. Do I even have them? And well, turns out, yes, I did. So once you 
get into this sort of mentality of preparing stuff, well, CVs and cover letters that are specifically targeted to the, the skills that are more interesting to this kind of company, you might find yourself working through following levels uh, of selection. And uh, the steps uh, at Paradox, at the very least, uh, involve two different things. Uh, on one side, there is a practical test, uh, and on the other side, you have interviews. So uh, how does that work? It is not uncommon. That is something that is actually pretty common in the gaming industry. And you will say, a test? How am I supposed to pass a test if I don't have any coding experience? Well, first of all, if you are not applying uh, as a coder specifically, uh, the properly coding part is not that necessary. Um, as I mentioned before, and I will talk about more in detail later, I, I am a designer. I have applied as a content designer. So what was really important to prove through the test is your ability to learn the code, your willingness to do that at some point, but more than that, your potential as a designer. So as someone who, <laughs> let's connect back to the skills before, who can write in a proper written English that it's both engaging and appropriate for the time of uh, for the type of product that you're gonna sell and someone who is willing to learn and is able to learn as I was mentioning before about uh, coding and um, also someone who has the right mentality to handle uh, the design of something. For the interviews, instead, it connects back to, I found myself being successful through them, uh, connecting back to a point that we mentioned before, so the, the passion, the fact that at the end of the day, you need to be yourself, which is something that people always say. And uh, of course, no one really believes it because you know, you're gonna be nervous and stressed and, you know, there's a, the stakes are high and it's pretty normal. But if you are passionate about something and uh, it's going to show in interviews, uh, despite the nerves, despite everything else. And having been also on the other side, on the recruiting side and having uh, checked tests and having taken part in interviews myself, I can guarantee that the passion shines through you can see the difference immediately between a person who just wants a job, any, and someone who actually wants that job. So moving over, oh, hey, those was the part before. I should have shown you before that, but it doesn't matter. Well, going back to the concluding part, what do I actually do in the gaming industry? Well, um, first of all, I worked on Imperator Rome, that I'm showing you here, which was an extremely successful, had a really uh, difficult beginning. So it's now taking a long break from development, uh, but it was a perfect fit for myself at the time that I was hired because, well, as you can probably guess from the name, it deals with Romans, it deals with Greece, it deals with, uh, um, well, the, the Hellenistic period. On the other hand, more recently, I moved over to Crusader Kings 3, which is sort of our crown jewel currently, because it has the, received the highest rating of any Paradox job, and we are really proud of it and having a lot of fun working on it. Uh, I've started as a content designer, as I was saying, but most likely you're gonna start, in, uh, we should start from a step back and, this, and explain a bit more about what is a designer. First of all, there are dozens of types of designers. There are UX designers, where UX means the user experience. So what is the user interface? but also narrative designers, system designers, 
combat designers, level designers, literally every company, every game inside of a company need specific types. But so, you know, if you apply to different companies, you might not have content designers, but you will have other types of designers. Uh, generally speaking, all designers deal with uh, everything the player sees, reads, or interact with. Uh, a content designer, more specifically, is a type of narrative designers, but it's a very peculiar type of narrative designers because it, it's, um, the content designer is not only involved in, uh, um, well, missions, writing missions and writing dialogues and events and stories like a regular narrative designers. But what we also had to do was working with history, uh, writing databases, checking historical facts and checking historical references that are useful for um, artists, for instance, to create whatever they they're going to put into the game and show to the player. And uh, finally, to script, uh, in case someone is not familiar with it, but scripting is a type of, uh, um, well, lightweight code, if you want to say, that we use to, um, to set up events and interactions and uh, things that happen under certain conditions in game. Uh, which means that it was a sort of an ideal position for me for, because me, it allowed me to, to practice and show many of the skills that we were discussing before. Because writing dialogue and events uh, requires someone to be a good writer. Uh, missions or uh, more uh, larger, basically, features uh, requires the sort of organization, uh, the setting priorities, connection, logical succession of things. Uh, the historical research and the references fit perfectly into, well, whatever I knew and I learned about doing historical research uh, and uh, even more doing it quickly in an effective way. And uh, finally, scripting was the ideal background to learn how to, um, well, to show uh, what, how good of a learner I was, how quickly I could master something that was sort of different from everything that I learned before, but also at the same time, how quickly I could become um, proficient at teaching that same thing. Uh, more recently, my job description has changed to game designer, which is uh, a content designer plus plus. So it also involves another uh, set of responsibilities that require a bit more of a large scale vision because you're also, uh, well, designing, <laughs> quite obviously, uh, systems and the features, not just uh, the single events or happening, uh, and also balancing this kind of thing. So making sure that the game is fun because no uh, part and no feature is too hard or is too easy, or it's just not fun. And also dealing with uh, some levels of setup of the AI, so the artificial intelligence that plays, well, everything that is not the player inside of the game. Again, all of those things requires the same skill as before, but pushed up to another level, to a more advanced level, um, more of a large scale ability to write, for example, uh, effective design documents uh, in which you explain how a system or a feature will look, will play, will feel, uh, and also step by step what the, the rest of the team, so the coders and the content designers, the artists, the user interface uh, artists and designers will need to do and to prepare for, um, for the whole feature to come together. 
So to, to sum it all up, I'm not saying that you should all come to Paradox because it's the best place in the world uh, and not even that you all should drop out of academia because, um, I mean, the, the video game industry is so much better than everything else. Entering the market is difficult. In any case, I found that Paradox Interactive was a pretty uh, easier, more approachable place to, to enter, but it's definitely not impossible to get into other fields of the market. Uh, so what is really important is that you do have a lot of skills, you as historians or classicists or any uh, academic discipline in this field, uh, you do have skills that are highly sought after and uh, real passion and real interest um, go a long way. And at the same time, having a different point of view and a different background, it's something that it can be extremely valuable. So all in all, I can just say, don't be afraid to try. And yep. With this, I think I can probably conclude my rambling and uh, give you back the, <laughs> the microphone if there are any questions. Thank you so much. That was that was amazing. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, that was an, an incredible talk. Um, <laughs> Thank yes, you. <laughs> uh, as, as Claudia said, we're now going to open it up to our Q&A. Uh, feel free to come forward with any questions you have. You can, <clears throat> excuse me. You can type it uh, in chat if you don't want to turn on your microphone, but you are obviously welcome to turn on your microphone and uh, and just speak it. Um, and raising the hand function might be good if there's a lot of people trying to go at once. Um, I know that just to kind of start us off, uh, I can ask the one thing on my mind is in terms of applying those skills you talked about, I really liked how you meant how you brought light to like, what's, what are the skills that you have from academia that are applicable? Because that's something that I know a lot of people sometimes feel concerned about is what, what am I studying with academia and how can I apply this? What do you think would be some uh, first steps that somebody can take where maybe if they only know academia, how they can start practicing using those skills in a context that's more suited to game design? Whether that be, I don't know, maybe a student project some sort of uh, endeavor like that? Well, one thing to consider is that, I mean, you, you are already using those skills. I think that probably the most difficult tran transition is not actually to apply them to a different settings, but it's understanding them. So understanding that you have those skills and what they are and uh, how you will be able to, to sell them, if you want to say, you know, to make other people really see that you have them and you know what to do. Because from, I don't know, from my personal experience, it was a pretty uh, fluid transition into those ones. You know, I had a clear idea, okay, I know that I can do this stuff. I could see it myself, you know, I mentioned it doing a te the test when I applied for, uh, for the job. And uh, it took me a week to prepare it, uh, in which I spent most of my time studying scripting guides and the guidelines. And uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't perfect because also the, the guides weren't that in-depth and it was just a week. But at the same time, I knew that I could, I noticed myself that, you know, I could actually gain a, a, a basic level proficiency into that just by studying it because I knew how to systematically study something, organize it, take notes uh, and, uh, you know, apply it while doing it step by step and uh, organizing and planning an idea, etc. So I think that gaining the concept, um, you know, the, the, the self-awareness basically is the, the most difficult thing. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was an amazing answer. Uh, I think I want to pass it to uh, Marcella with the ha um, your hand up, and then we'll go into the two that we have in the chat. Thank you, Nikki. Um, thank you so much, Claudia, for your talk. It was really, really interesting. 
I was wondering if you have any experience or knowledge at all in terms of like historical consultancy for the game industry. The reason why I'm asking this is because Assassin's Creed has always been my favorite franchise of all time. And even before I joined undergraduation, I am a historian. Um, I had this dream of like, I want to work for Ubisoft and I want to be a historical consultant, but I don't know how that works. So if you could talk a little bit about that, if you know, that'll be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, it's something that I don't have personally ex direct experience in. I know that it's something that has been, I mean, it is used by some companies, but not uh, as much as they could and should in most cases, but it's getting better. So it is pretty much a, a developing field. Uh, one thing that I noticed is that uh, at least so far, because again, as I was saying, it's a pretty much of a developing uh, sector. But what I've noticed so far is that usually you don't have uh, uh, regular contracts as a, an historical consultant, but you have temporary um, consultancy, exactly. So uh, usually you are sort of required to still have a job in academia. And uh, basically, that is what pays the bills <laughs> more, more normally. And then maybe you can work uh, for uh, some months uh, in connection with uh, uh, as a consultant. And then they require something of you. So you are going to work on, uh, I don't know, the historical uh, background of a particular city in that period for that certain game. And that's going to take you maybe, I don't know, three months, six months or something like that, in which you get paid uh, probably not much <laughs> by the, the company. And, um, and so that's how it currently works. I know that is something that it's growing it's getting more important because well you can easily see it even just in ubisoft because again it is one of the things that we talked about in uh, in classics in edinburgh among the the phd community back then was exactly literally going into assassin's creed odyssey and looking at the uh, reconstruction of the Acropolis uh, of Athens and of a bunch of other uh, archaeo famous archaeological sites to actually see how they've been reconstructed and they've been reconstructed in an incredibly faithful way which means that well they did work with academics and the uh, archaeologists and historians in that field so yeah it is changing basically it's developing it's getting better but yeah, I don't think that as it is right now, there are just jobs 100% for that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your question. Um, now I think we can turn to some questions that have been sitting in the chat. So the first one is from uh, Sarah Cole. Uh, Sarah says, hi, interesting talk. I'm in a noisy train station, but I had a question. All right, that's fair. Uh, did you not need a design portfolio when applying to games jobs? Most places want to see one. And uh, Sarah adds later that uh, they are a freelance broad spectrum designer and former classical civilization student. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so for uh, Paradox, it was not strictly required. Uh, usually, at least from what I've seen, uh, I mean, I can speak for Paradox. Uh, um, I know that is something that if you have, of course, you are required to send it, but if you don't, uh, they are already pretty happy to just see something that you have written, because again, it's, uh, it was a job that it's mostly focused on uh, narrative aspects. So as I was saying before, showing that you are a good writer, basically. Uh, I know that some places, uh, uh, Re well, not require, but ask you if you have a design portfolio. Uh, 
Uh, but sometimes they, actually most times, they could be and are pretty willingly to consider other alternative means. The important thing is understanding uh, what they are looking for from that design portfolio. Because if they are looking for, uh, again, uh, seeing how well you write, uh, it's quite likely that, you know, sending even a a paper. I mean, when I applied, I sent in a paper, the, the transcription of a paper that I presented at the conference, just making sure that it was a sort of approachable topic, nothing too technical. So it was, it made sense also for some non-technical audience, basically. Um, so that would be enough if they are specifically looking for uh, um, a I don't know, a, a design of a feature, basically, or something more complex, uh, uh, it might be useful, for example, well, in, in my case, we had the test, so I could actually show it right away how it worked. So it is something that changes a lot between companies, basically. And uh, I will say that the most important thing is understanding what they are trying to go from it and uh, trying to, to fit around it. Because again, that's one of the things that uh, uh, we are always told uh, that you know, sometimes even if you don't check all the boxes in a job, uh, you need just to go for it and try it anyway. And if they ask you why you didn't have this particular experience, you didn't have this particular criteria, you can show that you actually met all the other criterias and have a solid background, etc. And you can work into filling the missing one. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah, for the question. All right. So we have uh, one more in the chat. And uh... Oh, and there's another one after that. So we'll, we'll try to get through everything in time. Um, Matthew says, thanks, Claudia. Really enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I was wondering if the specific topic or area of your thesis was a relevant factor at all in joining Paradox or was it completely skills-based? That is a very good question. Yeah, um, no, not really. Um, I think that probably having a background, a strong background in classics had some influence in general in saying, oh, okay, I'm applying to Imperator Rome. I could say, you know, this takes place during the Hellenistic period. That's literally my period. That's what I've worked and studied on for most of my life. But apart from that, not, not more specifically than that. Um, just to say, of the people who worked with me in the same uh, on Imperator, uh, there were two who had a background in uh, game design specifically, and another guy who has a degree in, uh, in philosophy. So it's, yeah. All right, thank you. And then um, Mark says, fascinating talk, and I just have to ask. What was it like in the office when they were putting uh, Imperator on ice? <laughs> was it already known? Was anyone surprised? So, well, I uh, mean, a spicy one to end. <laughs> yeah. Well, on one side, there wasn't an office because we were still all completely working from home in that period because it was still full COVID. So I can't say about the atmosphere in the office because, again, everyone was home and we talked a bit. And, well, I mean, I can't say because I'm not allowed to disclose much of the back, uh, background of everything, but yeah, there was a, a lot going on, I just say. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was known for a while how things were going and at the same time, it was a partially surprise and it's, it worked out. As it is for, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you for the uh, questions, everyone. I'll yes. leave it for just a little in case anyone has some uh, last minute questions. If you want to think of that or type type that because uh, we're actually timing out very well. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to, uh, first of all, uh, thank Claudia again. Thank you for the amazing speech uh, talk presentation, yes. whatever you want to call it. It was <laughs> awesome. Yes. Uh, it was a lot of fun. 
a uh, lot of really, really good information. And um, thank you everybody again for your questions, helping us yes. go deeper into this. I think it's really cool to see somebody going from academics to working in, in a creative field at all. That's mm -hmm. something I'm, I'm very excited about, especially games, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to let everyone know that uh, we will be again having our second game night of the year. That's going to be next week on Tuesday. Uh, that would be Tuesday, the 25th of October, and that is from 6 to 9 p.m. It's going to be at Old College at Edinburgh. Um, more information that will be posted on our socials very, very soon, so keep an eye out. Um, it, again, if you found this, you should be able to find the information on that because it'll be posted in all the same places. Um, and even, even if you missed the first one, please feel free to show up, come in, uh, hang out, talk more about games, play some games, and uh, we have another seminar coming up in November. So look forward to information on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, with that we can wrap up. It looks like there's no more questions and everyone can be on your merry ways. <laughs> thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm going to stick evening. around a little at the end. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye.